handle. They do. <laughs> I guess so. So, all right. Well, let's get started here. Um, if you have your Bibles, you might want to look at Philippians. Um, just keep your finger or marker in the passage that you're going to look at. But look at Philippians uh, chapter one. Sit. Sit. And. Um, Remember how we find Philippians? Uh, what is it? General Electric Power Company. General Electric Power Company. So you look for the P. Galatians. It comes before Colossians. Yeah. General Power Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Okay, there you go. So Philippians chapter 1, and uh, we're continuing on, uh, verses 12 through 19. This is lesson 3, 12 through 19. Look at what it says. Philippians 1, verse 12. But I would be, uh, should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather than unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. All right, so that's verses 12 through 17. Now, that's the King James Version. Uh, so, Laura, what version do you have? I think NIV. NIV. Why don't you read, it, uh, read the NIV version and listen to it now, verses 12 through 17. Here it now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not, sincere, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. Wow, there you go. All right, take your Bibles home and say, I believe. I believe. My Bible. My Bible. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. I will love it. I will love it. I will run it. I will learn it. And I will live it. And I will live it. To the glory of God. To the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Our commitment to the Word of God. So, what is it that makes your faith and trust in Jesus Christ believable to those outside of the faith, to those who are lost? What makes your faith and your trust in Jesus believable to people who don't know Christ? What is it that, that makes them say they've got something? They truly believe what they say they believe. What makes it believable? Well, wait, that's a, kind of a, just a little rhetorical question to start with. I just want you to think about it for a second, because Paul reveals to us that trials and afflictions are what can further the gospel if they're responded to in a Christ-honoring way. So if, if we face our trials, if we face our afflictions, if we face our troubles in a Christ-honoring way, God can certainly use that to convince people who are lost that what we have is real to us. That it's real. It's not just something we say, but it's something we truly what? Believe and live. Yeah. That's what Paul's talking about here. Today we're looking at enjoying life in the midst of adversity as a way to deal with stress. How to enjoy life in the midst of adversity. Now, let's take a look at what he says here. Follow along, and I'll read what Hugo says. He says, Paul wrote the book of Philippians, which describes stress-free living in the midst of all kinds of adversity. After Paul was arrested in Jerusalem for preaching the gospel, False testimony about him is given in court, and he's been imprisoned in Caesarea for two years. Now, since he's a Roman citizen, Paul uses his right to appeal to Caesar and is transported then to Rome. A storm adds to his problems by causing his ship to run aground, and then according to Acts 27.41, what happens? Listen to this. But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship around and the bar. The prow struck fast and remained immovable, but the stern was broken and up by the violence of the world. All right. So the bow gets stuck and the stern is broken to pieces by the pounding surf. That's what he just said. That's what he just read. That's what, that's what gets written in there. The bow gets stuck and the stern is broken to pieces by the pounding surf. Um, let's read on. It says, after swimming to shore, 
After after all that happens, now Paul gets bitten by a poisonous snake. Oh, wow. It seems to me Paul's had a bad couple of years, don't you think? I mean, he's had a really rough couple of years. All right? So it says, when he finally arrives in Rome, Paul's put under house arrest, where he spends about two years chained to a Roman guard as he waits his hearing before Caesar. Now, Paul not only can't continue his missionary journey or the church he's established, but he also has no privacy either, no personal privacy. During this time, Paul writes a letter about stress-free living because he knows how to enjoy life, not just to endure it. And there's a big difference, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you can face adversity and you can endure it, or you can face it and enjoy it in spite of it, or enjoy life in spite of the adversity. Not enjoy the adversity, but enjoy life in spite of it. And Paul learned how to do that. So to enjoy life in the midst of adversity, we've got to do at least three things as outlined as Paul outlines in this passage. And the first is this. We've got to, we've got to keep problems in perspective. When, when you're facing problems and issues, you've got to keep them in perspective. It says after a few years of severe adversity and while chained to a prison guard in Rome, what does Paul write in Philippians 1.12? Listen to this. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Wow. So that's what you're writing there. What has happened to him has helped to advance the gospel. What happened to him has helped to advance. That's what he said. He said, what's taking place in my life is making the gospel go forward. Hmm. Well, that seems weird. So the more you suffer, the further the gospel goes. Is that right? Yeah. Well, hopefully. Didn't you convert the guard that he was chained to? Yeah, oh, Absolutely. Can you see that in a second? Oh, they, they could see he's yeah. living a life. A lot of them, man. It's, a, it's pretty amazing. Look at it. It says, this part of Paul's life seems to be a series of setbacks, but Paul says his circumstances had served to advance the gospel. Now, Paul can keep his problems in perspective because he knows that God has a purpose for allowing him. You might want to underline that little phrase right there. He knows that God has a purpose for allowing him. Look, the honest truth is there's nothing that happens in your life that God doesn't know about. There's nothing you're going through that God doesn't know about. I mean, he, he, he understands, he knows what you're going through. And, and when you're leaning on him and trusting in him, he can take that bad thing and turn it into something what? As Romans says, Romans 8, very good, right? He can take the bad and the ugly, good, bad, and the ugly and turn it into something good. He can certainly do that. So he says, it says, goes on to say, one purpose for his imprisonment has become clear because Paul writes, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. He says it's become evident to everybody that the reason I'm here is because of my relationship with Christ. Now, the word translated palace guard is the word praetorium, and it refers to the elite praetorian guard who provided security for Caesar's palace and served as Caesar's bodyguards. Now, they were also the future generals and leaders of the Roman Empire. So when you're thinking about the generals and, and all the guys who would lead the Roman Empire, they were chosen out of the praetorian guard. This is a very elite group. It's a very elite group, a uh, very influential and important group of guards like this. And so these guards changed about every four hours, which means then that Paul was changed, chained to six different guards every day. So six times 365 days equals 2,190. And 2,190 times two years equals 4,380 times that he was with the guards. I mean, he's with a guard 24 hours a day, chained to him. And every every six hours or four hours, whatever it was, they, they, he changed, the guard changes. And uh, and when they change, change then it's, it's another member of the congregation. I, I mean, as a result, many of these guards became believers, Hegel says, and history tells us that, that, that some, even some of Nero's family, including Nero's wife, become believers, including Nero's wife. Can you imagine being chained to your congregation 24 hours a day. <laughs> I mean, this was his congregation. I mean, and, and he's chained to him. Uh, there's no place else to go. You don't have to go to the bathroom. You can to go. Yeah. <laughs> can't, can't, yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, that's like, you know, it's like it's like he'd go to the bathroom in there and it'd be like, all right, just, uh, just you know, he'd be chained. Have to, have to, you know, they wouldn't they wouldn't let him loose the chains. Even to, I mean, it was, it was that kind of a deal. I mean, it was... Uh, those kind of prisons were very intense. Nothing like, nothing like prisons. Imagine today. they considered him that dangerous just for yes. speaking about Christ. Because he spoke about Christ. And he had to be he held is. that tightly. Yeah, and held that tightly. And is it? Don't you feel like we're getting back to that place? 
Don't you just feel like we're getting there where to be a Christian today is, is to be in a, a dangerous place? To be a Christian today who's outspoken and who stands up, I mean, boy, you better be careful about standing up for Jesus Christ and the Word of God in the face of Pride Month. You better be careful about what you say, because if you're a Christian, and uh, I mean, even even those guys on what team, one of the, one of the baseball teams, yes. you know, who stood up for Christ and said, we're not going to wear the Pride flag, man, they are coming under constant attack, brutal attack. For, their, for standing up for what they believe in. And they're very gentle and docile about their responses to it all and, and actually much more gentler and, and, uh, and, and more docile in their approach than I would be. But they're, they're basically saying, you know, hey guys, we respect your right to be whatever you want to be and do whatever you want to do, but that doesn't mean that we have to support that. In our faith, we just don't. And they're being labeled bigots and racist and anything you can... Think of, I mean, they're just they're taking a beating publicly uh, in the press and everywhere else um, like that. So it's, it, you know, we're living in that day and age now where uh, immorality rules to the point that if you dare stand up for morality, you're going to be singled out as a person who's dangerous. Not those who are the transgenders stripping and dancing before children in Dallas. I mean, they're not the dangerous ones. We are, you know, because we don't believe in exposing children to that kind of thing. Or uh, teaching so, them that. Yeah, or teaching them that. Or, 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 you know, even saying it's okay for some people to do that. It's not okay. It's child abuse. It, it, it is child abuse. And, and, and yet we're, you know, we're in a culture now, I think, very much like that, which Paul was facing in his day right there. So it goes on to say, says Hegel says, the phrase everyone else could refer to the palace servants, you know, because, you know, it, there, was, there was everybody else involved there, government officials or even members of Nero's family. Paul was successful in winning some of them to Christ because he writes, all the saints send you greetings. All the saints send you greetings. Then what does he write in the rest of that verse? Listen to the rest of that verse. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. Whoa, wow. So he, he, he's saying to the Christians... Guess who got saved? Guess who's a part of the family of God now? Those who were in Caesar's household. Now that could be not only the servants, but could be very influential people who are actually members of his family who got saved. Um, now, although not all were saved in his family, many were, and, the, and, 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 and by the way, let me just add to the point. They were saved to the point that Tertullian, later on, Tertullian, who was the Jewish historian of that day, he wrote that, and, and by the way, Tertullian was not a Christian, but he, uh, he certainly uh, recorded what was happening to the Christians and wrote that down. And so we have, we have a secular accounting of everything that happened as well as the biblical account of what was going on. But Tertullian wrote that the Roman government became disturbed when it was discovered that Christians were in a position of authority. <laughs> wow. Christians in a position of authority. Can you imagine that? How about an American government? Can you imagine Christians in a position of authority? There were at one time. Well, we were, yeah. There were a lot of Christians in authority at one time, and now it's getting harder and harder to find them. And if they are in authority, then their Christianity is singled out as abuse and things like that, So and misplaced and shouldn't be, should not be in government or anything like that. So... Um, but, in fact, many of these who were singled out in Caesar's family, who were Christians and in that place of authority, they were later uh, put to death for their faith. They, they, were, they were executed for their faith. But Hegel goes on to say, he says, Paul sees himself as a preacher with a captive audience. <laughs> so, <laughs> so who's really the captive audience here? Is, it, is, it, is Paul the captive or is it the prison guards? You know, they're the ones who are really the captives, aren't they? Can you imagine being chained to Paul? I mean, Paul was nonstop talking about Jesus. Paul was nonstop preaching the gospel. Paul was nonstop relating how the Bible fits and how. And, and every four to six hours, he would get a new person to start all over with again. And, and then the next day, it'd be maybe one of the other ones uh, that, that was there the day before. Well, where did we leave off? Okay, well, let's pick up right there. And you just go on with them again like that. I mean, these guys, these guys, in the time that they had Paul in there, they were getting a theological education like nobody, I think, ever got prior to that. I mean, th this, this is pretty amazing what he's doing here. But it says, it says, therefore, instead of having a pity party about his problems, Paul writes a letter about joy and stress-free living. 
So Hegel says, the devil tries to use our problems to discourage us and destroy our witness, but God often uses them for the good of other people. That's why Paul writes, because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and more fearlessly. Wow. So our attitudes toward our problems will either encourage or discourage other believers because we either let God or the devil use our problems to affect other people. Isn't that the way it works? I mean, how we respond to the problems is going to affect other people. It's either going to affect them for the cause of Christ or not. Uh, so, it, and if it's not for the cause of Christ, then Satan's pretty much won that battle, right? I mean, he's, he, it's so, so let me just ask you real quick here. Is it okay to be discouraged when you face trials and tribulations and struggles and challenges and health issues and all that? Is it okay to be discouraged? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is, because we're all going to face that. But don't stay there. Don't stay there. Find a way out through Jesus Christ. Find a way out through your relationship with Christ of that discouragement and let God turn it into something that can be used to benefit other people. In some form, some fashion, maybe it's just your family. Maybe your family needs to be encouraged in their faith. So let God turn it around. We all go through moments of discouragement. And I'm not trying to discourage you from being discouraged. I just say don't, don't live there. Don't stay there. We all face it. We all deal with it. But don't stay there, okay? So it goes on to say here that faith is more caught than taught because faith is contagious. Is faith contagious? Yes. yes. Faith is very contagious if we let it be. If, if, it's, if it's watered and cultivated and fertilized, faith is very contagious. And, uh, and, and, and so no one will ever be encouraged by your faith until they see how you respond to severe adversity. Now, like Joseph, what could Paul say to those who conspired to have him put in prison? Listen to, listen to what Joseph said in Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Wow, that's what you write in there. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. That's, that's what Joseph said, and that's what Paul is basically saying with his life, right? You guys intended to harm me with this, but you know what? I'm gonna try, I'm, God intended it for good because you guys are all getting saved. You guys are getting, I mean, these guards are getting saved. And by the way, they ended up in positions of authority because remember, it was the Praetorian Guard that ultimately was called on for generals and for everything else like that. And positions of authority were, were, were pulled out of the Praetorian Guard. So, so there were Christians now entering into high places of authority like that. So it's important, I think, that we, we never know who God is going to use beyond our ability to affect them for the gospel. So we infect somebody else with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and maybe it's a young person who grows up to achieve a position of authority in government or someplace else. I mean, they're in a position now where their influence is great, but their influence is that way because we had a part in that, because of our influence. Our influence is carried on to the next level. Uh, and that's the same with children. Uh, I just tell you that, that our influence as we, as, we, as we honor Christ and as we raise our children according to the Word of God and as we invest ourselves in God's Word in, in their lives and stuff, and then our children will take it to the next level. Our children will then carry it to the next level and then their children to the next level. Uh, is that always the case? Not always, but a lot of the time. Most of the time it is. And so um, I, I think it's important that we understand that, that it's not, it's not something that that uh, faith is not, not something that, that, that's just, you just kind of roll into it. It's, it's something that's, that's caught from somebody else. It's because somebody else witnessed to us by their life. And because we saw their life and the kind of life they lived, it influenced us toward Jesus Christ like that. So he, he says, he says, do you believe that verse? You know, you intended to harm me, but God intended to forgive you. Do you believe that verse? Do you live like you believe it when you have severe adversity? See, it's easy to talk the talk, but adversity reveals whether or not we really walk the walk then. Uh, struggles and challenges and adversity does that. Um, so to enjoy life in the midst of adversity, keep problems in perspective. That is, remember, God can use them. Yeah. I think sometimes the way we respond to death is the most, I don't know if it's, confusing to people or if it's it's sometimes challenging to people because 
we can seem either cold or, um, I don't know, not, not, but just like it, we don't, we don't immerse ourselves right. because we know, if we know where our, that our loved one is with God, I, I'm, not, I'm glad. I'm not, you know, yeah. I'm not going to wallow in it. Right. And it just really, I think that confuses people sometimes. It's, well, sometimes it does. And, yeah. and they can't they can't understand uh, grieving. They grieve as if there's no hope. We grieve with because, hope. We because, because we know there's yeah, hope. And, yeah. and we, have, we, have, we have hope in Jesus Christ, of course. And, and we know where our loved ones are, like you said. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think it is confusing at times to some folks. And, and I think that's that's key. I think that's important. I think... I think the confusion in other people causes them to ask questions too. Yeah. Because they go, "What's the matter with you? Why? Why aren't you crying? Why aren't you all?" Well, because I know where they're at. I, I have hope in Christ, and I know they're more alive now than they've ever been before. I, I know that they're in heaven right now. I have no doubt about that. I knew that about my mom. Uh, you know, I grieve for my mom, and I would cry a little bit at night because I miss her because I miss her presence and stuff. But uh, I know where she's at. I have no doubt about my mom's relationship with Christ. I know she's in heaven. And I know she's she's way much, especially because she had Alzheimer's at the end, and I, you know, and that was that was horrible. And and so in heaven, there's no more suffering, no more sickness, no more sorrow. Oh, she's way better there in heaven, and and that's where we're all gonna be someday. Amen. And, and, and so we do approach it differently like that. So I think that's uh, I think that's a good point because it, it is uh, it is confusing, but I think that confusion causes questions, and I think that opens the door for us to give some answers maybe and mm -hmm. to plant some seeds about why we aren't torn to pieces, why we aren't just utterly devastated. Oh, my dad's home. I forgot to turn off my phone, uh, as you can tell. Turn so, it on silent. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> so, uh, let me so okay. quick because I have a feeling. She's going to go to the other for <laughs> What? Maybe it, it, it said maybe eight times. Yeah, I mean, it might do it. I've had it happen like that before, too. So somebody sent a picture or stuff like that. Uh, all right. So uh, it's important that we believe the verse, that, that we understand that when we're dealing with problems, let's keep it in perspective by remembering that God can use this. God can deal with this. Now, look, I certainly am not looking forward to a country struggling to feed itself. Struggling for food, you know, empty shelves in the grocery stores. Uh, it was not easy to see moms scrambling trying to get milk for their babies, and and how important it is for those small children. And it's, it's not easy looking at those things, but from another perspective, God knows what's happening. And if I'm going to keep that in perspective, I have to realize that God can use this. If we as his people will submit to his authority, if we'll submit to him and trust him and, and continue to have hope in him, irregardless of what happens, and then let God use us to minister to others with the purpose of bringing them into a relationship with Christ. You know, it seems to me that uh, difficult times is the time to trust Christ. Well, I've, I've heard people who are proud say, well, I never trusted Christ when, when things were good, so I'm not going to trust Christ when things are bad, because that would just be hypocritical. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> that, that in itself is a hypocritical statement. I said, you know, because why do you think God allows these difficult times? Because he wants you to come to know him. He's waiting for you to come to know him. Um, don't, don't wait for the good times. Just do it now. Today's the day of salvation. Amen? I mean, that's what, that's what he meant. Today's the day. Well, anyway. Okay, number two, not only keep problems in perspective, but keep critics in context. <laughs> keep the critics in context. Now, there was a problem in Paul's day that, unfortunately, to be honest, is still a huge problem in our day. And, in fact, it will always be a problem in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, at least until the return of Christ. It's, it's going to continue to be a problem, and that is the problem of criticism. Um, take a look at what he says. He says, if you want some stress in your life, just let other people start criticizing you. You think that brings stress into your life? Yes. Yeah. People criticizing what you're doing, and, and, and uh, that'll, that'll create stress. See, Paul has this problem, too, because he writes, it is true that some preach Christ today out of envy and rivalry. 
Now, some other preachers apparently envy Paul, and they're using his problems as an opportunity to discredit Paul. And the word envy refers to feelings of displeasure produced by seeing or hearing about the success of others. People who are envious feel bad that somebody else has success when they think they should be the ones feeling that and having that success. You know, one of the things that can hurt, I think, the preaching of the gospel probably more than anything is envy. Envy can really hurt the preaching of the gospel because it hurts the preacher. It can hurt the preacher. And once it hurts the preacher, then the preaching is affected. And, uh, and, and, and envy is something that does, does that. Paul, uh, Hegel says some, some, some envy Paul's success in proclaiming the gospel and, uh, and the fact that he is uh, recognized as an authoritative apostle. And over, Hegel says, in over 35 years of pastoring, Hegel says, I have observed that people who are always criticizing church leaders are usually envious of them. If there's criticizing and criticizing church leaders, it's usually because there's some envy there, because they feel like they should have what they have, or they should be doing what they're doing, or they have a better right to be doing what that other person is doing. And so they're, it, it's, it's an envy, like, like, you know, like, I should be there, not them. It should be me doing this, not them. And, uh, and if you were to ask me, Pastor, have you faced that before in your ministry? The answer is over and over again. Uh, I can't tell you how many times in the past 40 years that uh, there's been criticism levied against me and come to find out it's just simply because of envy. Because they, they don't like the fact that, that God is using me when they think it should be them who's being used of God in that setting or in that capacity. And, uh, and so it, it, it creates them, they have to bring me down in order to elevate themselves. Does that make sense? And, and, and so, and, and I don't care, I mean, in the sense that, um, you know, I, I'm nothing special. I'm just a guy who just submits to God's authority and let God do what he does in me and stuff. And, and so, you know, I, I've never considered myself above anybody else anyway. I, I, just, I, just, I just do what God called me to do. That's, that's what I do. And, uh, and, and yet, there's a lot of folks who don't like that. And, and they don't like, there's a lot of folks, to be honest with you too, that don't like confidence. They don't like a pastor who's confident. And they feel like because that confidence, of that confidence, that he's, he's taking too much authority, or he's too bossy, or he's whatever. No, he's just, he's just confident. Pastors who are confident, they know what God's told them to do, and they're going to do it. And nothing anybody does or says is going to change what they're doing and what they're after because they know what God's told them to do. And so, you know, confidence, that kind of confidence comes from the Spirit, and, and, uh, and sometimes people really are envious of that. He says sometimes they're envious because they think people less spiritual than they hold positions of leadership in the church. Um, and some are envious because they see someone else getting recognition that they, and so they feel ignored. But whatever the reason, envy is a terrible sin. Amen? Amen? The Bible makes that real clear. It's a terrible sin. That's why Proverbs 27.4 asks what rhetorical question. Listen to this. Anger is cruel and fury overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? Wow. Now listen to that verse very carefully. Anger is cruel, that's what you write in there, and fury overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? Of those three, jealousy is what? The worst. Jealousy is the one that probably will take you down quicker than either of the other two. See, this means jealousy or envy is more serious than anger. That's what Hegel says. Hegel says, I would rather have someone angry with me than jealous of me. I would too. And you know why? Because people get over being angry. When somebody gets angry at me, they usually come and yell at me and they scream at me and then I just sit and talk and you know what? It's over. They feel better. And they feel better, and it's they got it out, and everybody's forgiving, or go back and forth forgives, and it's over. You know, when when there's anger like that, you can you know people get and Christians do that too. They'll get heads. You know, uh, there were times when I'd be in a deacons meeting, and and the deacons and I we butt heads. But there's one thing I never I, I never doubted was their love for me, and I never doubted their care for me. And, uh, and, and yet we would butt heads over things, and then they, they would say, well, Pastor, I do this, you know, and I would say, yeah, but I don't, you know, and then they'd go, okay, whatever, and, and it would be over, because they got it out. They were able to do that right there, but it was a private, it was a one-on-one -on -one thing, and, uh, and it was just us and the deacons, and, and you know, one of the rules we had in the deacons' meetings, in the deacon, whenever we had deacons' meetings, one of the rules was, what happens in a deacons' meeting stays in a deacons' meeting. 
and uh, we don't we don't talk to about our wives. We don't tell them about it. We don't we don't discuss it. We just we don't want to bring anybody down. We you know this is just between us. And, and you know sometimes I think it's that way. I respect a Christian who comes to me with that um, with that mindset. In other words, Pastor, I'm angry at you, but they're talking to me privately. They're not doing it and blowing up in front of everybody like that and stuff. Now, that happens, and it does happen. And when it does, okay, we deal with it. We go on. And most usually people ask, I'm sorry, I, I, forgive me. It just, I don't know why. It just came over me, and I did it. And, and we do that and everything like that. But, but then the pastor, you know, can, can forgive. It's a place of forgiveness then. Anger, can, anger that's, that, 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 that is recognized, and then they say, yeah, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to blow up like that. And that's easily to be forgiven. Amen? Yeah. Mm-hmm. We can easily forgive that. that that's easy. I, I mean, look, my mom, she was so angry at me at times. Mm-hmm. I mean, my mom would blow up at me. But I never doubted she loved me. And she would yell at me. When I first, the first girl I ever started dating, ooh, she didn't like that girl at all. And she would, she would, she would yell at me, and she would, Doug, this is just, you know, and she, you know, and she'd get her finger going and stuff, and, and uh, I'd yell back at her, but you know what? We'd forgive each other, and we'd go on. Now, you know, anger can be forgiven. So parents get angry at their children. Children get angry at their parents. I, I wonder how many of you kids have ever been angry at your moms <laughs> or dads. I, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, hey, I mean to the point of yelling, screaming, throwing a fit, throwing things, uh, you know, I mean storming out, slamming doors, you name it. I mean, boy, we get it. You know. I guarantee you, your parents at that moment were like, oh my gosh, I've raised a real what have I done now? You know, and stuff. And, but then before long, there's forgiveness, there's acceptance, and we go on and we keep going because there's love there too. And love covers a multitude of what? Yes. Yes. You know, we love each other. But now, so he says, I'd rather have someone angry at me than jealous of me. Why? Because people get over being angry, but jealous people get more and more vicious. And jealous people, they never really get angry, they never let you see it. They just undermine, and they say things that creates criticism, and they, they pull the other person down by what they say in the eyes of other people. They keep doing that. That's why James 3.16 gives us what warning about envy. Listen to this. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. All right. So wherever I find envy and selfish ambition, there's going to be disorder and every kind of evil. Wherever I find envy and selfish ambition, there'll be disorder in every kind of evil, all kinds of evil, as a result of that. Uh, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been jealous? Yes. Have you ever been envious and jealous? Yes. Mm-hmm. I think we all felt that, haven't we? We've all been <sighs> Did it ever turn out good? No. <laughs> I cannot remember a time when my jealousy or my envy. Oh, you were never jealous. Yeah, whatever. And, and uh, you know, I'd get, when we were dating, I'd see some guy would, I was just, some guy would, I would instantly become jealous. And, you know, and what. Some guy what, that I would never be interested in. Yeah, and just but because he spoke to her, I was instantly jealous. And so, you know, it was, it was like those, those, and that was just the way I was. I was that way because, you know, I, I just, I just felt like she's mine. How dare it, you know, and stuff, and, and it was it was that kind of attitude though that created a barrier between us. It didn't endear us to each other; it just separated us. And every time I became jealous, it just hurt her and hurt her and hurt her. And then she would strike back at me, and and it would be you know because hurt people hurt people, and so that's what we do when we're hurt. We tend to hurt other people. So it, it was those kinds of jealousy never works out well. And and so he says he says envious. People gossip, criticize, and try to cause all kinds of problems for, for other people. Envy is always followed by rivalry or strife. Now, envy is the emotion, and rivalry is what envious people try to stir up them. Rivalry, trying to create this scenario where I would be better at this than they would. I would be, I would be better than they would. You know, that kind of rivalry situation. Uh, envious people 
are meaning. <laughs> I like that, that because that's just that's that's it in a nutshell. Envious people are just mean. They don't care if they cause strife, and they don't care who gets hurt or what damage is done to the church or whatever organization or uh, of which they are a part. They, they only care about their own agenda and getting their own way. That's the problem with envy. All its complete absorption in selfishness. And, uh, and they're only interested in what they want and what they can get. However, Paul also writes that some preach Christ out of goodwill. Okay, the latter do so in love, knowing that I put here for the defense of the gospel. And so that's what he said there in verse 15 and 16. So... When we have problems, we sometimes focus only on the bad guys and we forget about the others who do love us and the good people. And that's the problem with it, isn't it? Yeah. We tend to focus only on the bad, forgetting that there are a lot of other people who are good. And so that's when he says keep critics in context. Keep them in context. There may be some, but there's still a lot of other people who do love us. And there's still a lot of other people who do care about us. And so keep it in context. Don't be overwhelmed by the reality that there are going to be envious people that come in your life. There are going to be jealous people. There are going to be people who are jealous of your position, of what you do. I have no doubt that, that Becky, there's probably been people in your work environment who have been jealous of you and your job, or jealous of you and your influence, or jealous of you and the way you're able to communicate with other people and talk with other people. And, and uh, they, they would do whatever they could to get you out of the way so they could get your position and have that because they want what you've got. You know, and, and, and that's that's a that's a that's a scary thought because we're living in an environment and in a culture now where envy and jealousy is on the rise like never before because selfishness is on the rise like never before. And, uh, and so, but we just have to keep it in context that for every person who is envious and jealous, there's a whole bunch of other people who aren't and a whole bunch of other people who do care about us and love us and respect us. Keep it in, in context. Now, before I, referring to the first group, Paul says, the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in the chains. In other words, they're preaching the gospel, but with the wrong motives. Some of them are apparently trying to take Paul's place while he's in prison and are only interested in notoriety or influence and not getting out the message. Now, one of the solutions, I think, to the problem of envy, especially in Christianity, is for every Christian to recognize that they have a gift. All Christians have spiritual gifts. Amen? Amen. And, and that we all don't have the same gift. Our gifts are different. And even pastors, even preachers, guys who are called to preach the gospel, they all have the gift of preaching, but some are to different levels, some are to different abilities, some are to different, and that's on purpose. God doesn't give every preacher, every pastor, the same ability of communication to the same level or same level. He does that on purpose. He does that because, number one, he can be glorified in anybody who willingly just submits to, G, to, to Christ's authority. Amen. But, but not only that, it, different pastors reach different people. Different capabilities reach different people. Different, different educational levels reach different people. I, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's, it, that's the way God designed it. So, so even within, if you have the same gift as somebody else, it's still not the exact same gift. It's just designed a little bit differently because God has a purpose for it. But every person has to recognize they have a gift and, and that, that the body couldn't function without all these different gifts. We have to have these different gifts in play. The problem is that some people with one gift are envious of somebody else with a different gift. And maybe I, I want that gift or I want that <coughs> gift at a different level or, or whatever. But every gift is equally important and has to be exercised. Here's the key word, in love. And that's what we're talking about on Sunday morning, right? In love and in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, Paul said, Love envies not. Love vaunteth, vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. Uh, love's not vain. It's not envious. It's not puffed up. Envy says, I don't think much of you. That's what envy says. I don't think much of you. Pride says, what do you think of me? <laughs> and both are bad, aren't they? Both are bad. Both envy and pride destroy your joy. Love, love for God and love for other people overcomes envy and pride. That's what does it. The recognition that I have a spiritual gift and it's my love for other people that helps me to realize that I just need to use what God's given me to the benefit of other people. And, and just employ it for the benefit of other people. That's what we need to do. Well, Hebrew hey, goes on to say down there, he says, though some are preaching Christ out of jealousy and causing rivalry, Paul writes that regardless of the motive, at least the gospel is being preached. This is the cool thing. Now, this is, this is where I, I really like this. It says, so what is Paul's response to this? Listen to, listen to uh, Philippians 1.18. Listen to this. 
What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice ye, and will rejoice. All right, good. So he writes, in, he writes, he will rejoice, and he will continue to rejoice. That's what he says. I'm going to rejoice, I'm going to continue to rejoice. Despite the fact that gospel, the, the gospel of Christ being preached by some, by some idiots. <laughs> You know, by these guys who are just trying to do it for personal gain or whatever, I'm still celebrating the fact that the gospel is being preached. Paul knows that when someone preaches the gospel, even with wrong motives, people are still going to be saved. Therefore, Paul could keep his critics in context. And Hegel says, I can honestly say that I've learned more over the years from some of my critics than from any other group. Sometimes my critics, he says, have been totally off base, but many times God has used them to teach me something important. <clears throat> See, the important thing to Paul guys, was this. Paul was, that the gospel was being preached. That's the important thing. The gospel was being preached. And uh, you guys okay? Is that sound really good? It's, it's okay. It's just me, I think. Yeah, it's right, right in that position where it's, it's just right. one, it's like a laser I coming I'm, <laughs> I'm putting I'm my thing here. Okay. Right. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. But, but the important thing to Paul was that Christ was being preached. That's the important thing. And no matter what it was, and no matter, no matter whether it was done in pretense or whether it was done sincerely with true motives, it, it's comforting to know, I think, as a pastor, that Christ can even be preached insincerely, and people still get saved. Uh, and that's because God honors His Word, not the man or the organization. God honors His Word. That's why sometimes people ask me, do you think there are saved people in the Catholic Church? Yes. And I think, yes, there are. I think many of them who are saved in the Catholic I think there's a whole host that aren't. But I think many of them are, and those who are saved are confused because of the poor doctrine that they've been taught. But I think they're saved because at some point, whether it was sincere or insincere, they did hear the gospel and they received Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they got saved. And, uh, and so I, I think that can happen, and I, it was happening in Paul's day. And uh, I think it can happen any time. So, so he goes on to say, When dealing with critics, especially those who are destructive rather than constructive, I have found Proverbs 15, 1 invaluable. And so what is it? Listen, listen to this. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Okay. So a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So that's how you, that's how you respond gently. You know, when people who are being criti critical of you just... Don't, don't take it too personal. Don't take it... Don't feel like you've got to attack them back. Just respond with a gentle word. True. I mean, you can levy true. You can say, no, that's not true. That's not why I do what I do. That's not my motive. That's not what I'm doing. You know, but, but respond with a gentle answer. If you can, that takes the fuel right out of the critic's tank right there. They don't have anything to come back at you. I mean, they can keep harping at you and harping at you and harping at you, but again, if you respond with a gentle answer, what are they going to do? They're the ones who's going to be proven to be the insane one, not you. Amen? Amen. So you, you just, just remember to do that one. And as Christians in the day and age that we're living in right now, uh, I guarantee you that at some point, probably, if you continue to live out your faith, there's going to be people who attack you because of your faith. And they're going to be, they're going to get in your face and they, you know, uh, boy, this thing over the abortion is just, we thought it was bad a few weeks ago when I first, the news first broke. It, they're getting ready to announce it now. They're already got guards. and I mean, well, Kavanaugh, Judge Kavanaugh was just, some guy was out there getting ready to kill him. He was, he was arrested and, and with his weaponry and everything ready to kill Judge Kavanaugh. He was outside his house and he's arrested out there for that. So but this thing is just heating up a little bit and, and they're target, They're going to target the Christians. They're going to target those who because look, Christianity is the only thing that stands in the way of abortion at any age. <laughs> I mean, at any time. I mean, even outside the womb. Once the baby's born, if you don't want the baby anymore after a few years or whatever, it's fine. Abort it. You know, I, I, believe me, that's where we're headed. And, and by the way, that's not uncommon. They were doing that in Paul's day. That was happening in Paul's day. They were aborting children just by abandoning them out in the desert. They just feed them to the wolves. They just feed those children like that. I mean, it was it was horrendous what was happening to children in that day. Christians turned it around. Christians are the ones who, who gave value to life. Uh, of course, God gave the value, but Christians are the ones who recognize the value of life by virtue of God and His Word. And as a result of that, you know, 
humanity turned around in, in many ways, although there are still cultures that, but even in American culture, it, it's degrading now, and uh, the value of life is degrading, and, and so we have to keep elevating it, but don't be surprised if you get under attack by that. And have you ever thought to yourself how you're going to respond if somebody spits on you? There's been a lot of Christians spat upon. I've been spat upon as a Christian. Uh, I've been battling abortion since I first started my ministry. Uh, I used to go to the abortion clinics and we'd stand across the street and we'd peacefully try to get people not to go in. Because even then, we were touting, this was 40 years ago, we were touting abortion as murder. And we would stand on the streets with signs, just sent with, uh, it was, uh, remember it was the, uh, and, and, and churches would unite together, churches all across the city, and we would stand on both sides of the busiest street in Tucson, and we would all hold signs that says abortion is murder. And people would have to drive down several miles of people holding signs that says abortion is murder. And they hated that. And people spit at me, they threw things at me, they, I mean, and uh, standing across the street from the abortion clinic, and people run over like they were going to run at me and hit me, and I just stood there and They'd spit at me, and I'd raise the sun, and just, you know, and just say, God loves you, and just, you know, and, and just try to respond in a Christ-like way. Um, you know, that's truly turning the other cheek, I think. I think that's what Jesus meant when he said turn the other cheek. Uh, you know, that, that's kind of... So you have to determine in your heart and mind, before it happens, how you're going to respond to that. Because chances are, in the culture we're in today, a pretty good chance it will. And, uh, and if it does, you just determine how you're going to respond. Now, does that mean that you don't do anything about it? No. Maybe later on you do. Maybe later on you bring charges against another person. Maybe you do that because that's a, that's a proper, appropriate response then. But to react because of their reaction to your position in Christ, um, remember there are always other people watching. And it's those other people that we want to plant the seed of the gospel in. Because yeah. this other person, they don't, they don't, they don't want to hear it. They don't care at this point. But other people maybe want it. And, and it may be something they say, there's the difference between the two. That's the difference that Christ makes. It's their response versus theirs. So anyway, I just throw that out there at you. So remember, God can use your critics to teach you many things as he has me. It says, enjoy Life in the midst of adversity means that you keep problems in perspective, you keep critics in context, and then number three, keep prayer and the paraclete in the plan. Uh, so, and paraclete, we'll talk about that in a second here, but Paul continues, he says, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the, by who? The Spirit of Jesus Christ. Who is the Spirit of Jesus Christ? Who is that? The Holy Spirit. Okay, the Holy Spirit. What has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Okay. So Paul's saying no matter what the problems or who the critics are, there are two things that will strangle the stress that those things cause. Two things that will get it out of your life. The first one is prayer. If you engage in prayer, prayer will take the stress off of you. Now, let me ask you, before you read on, let me, let me ask you, why would that be the case? Because you're turning it over. Okay, because you're turning it over to God, so you're enlisting who on your side? God, right? You're enlisting God on your side. So, does that alleviate stress? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're not alone. Yeah, because you're not alone. And because you know the one who can change everything in an instant, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're praying, you're calling upon the one who can help. And then you rely upon who? I'm God, but in the form of who? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. So you rely upon the Holy Spirit then in dealing with whatever it is that's going on at the moment because you pray. You know, when you pray, you're calling upon the Holy Spirit anyway, right? I mean, you are. When you pray to the Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, right? Holy Spirit makes it possible for us to have communion with God, right? Because it's Jesus living in us, right? Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for us. So we get right straight to the Father through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. So when you pray, you're really talking to the entire Godhead, aren't you? 
So we're talking to all three of them at one time, and they're all three responding at the same time. And the Holy Spirit, then, is the one who brings comfort. He brings assurance, brings confidence. He brings change. And now the Holy Spirit begins to work in the power of Jesus Christ on other people, other situations, and things around them. So we can be free of the stress because now we've got Jesus helping us. But it's more than that, too. It's more, let me show you what I mean. It says, he says, no matter what problems or who the critics are, there are two things that will strangle the stress they cause. The first one is prayer. One thing that reveals our faith is our willingness to ask others, especially prayer warriors, then, to pray for us. Our pride often prevents us from asking anyone to pray for us, though, and failing to ask for the prayers of others shows our lack of faith in what promise in James 5.16. Listen to this. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Wow. So that's what you're writing. The prayer of a righteous person has great power and is effective. Yeah. So, you know, when somebody asks me to pray for them, I really want to pray for them. And I will pray for them. Because I, I know personally the power of prayer. And I know how effective prayer is. And I know how effective and powerful it is when I ask other people to pray for me, and they do. I know that that has influence. And that's meaningful to me. And so I want to be a part of that in somebody else's life as well. So it's important that we not be so prideful that we can't ask for other people to pray for us and to pray for the need. And, and you can pray for me. I, look, for example, I've got a blood test tomorrow. I'm doing for my, my PSA tomorrow. It's, it's been high and they tell me, they told me before that it's nothing to worry about and there was no cancer or anything there or anything like that, but but now it's high again, and so they want to, so I'm just praying that it be down again, because I have one of those prostates that that has high numbers, you know, now, and, and um, so I'm just praying that that's all it is, so I, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to ask you to pray for me about that, because I cut up prayers about that. Just like Brian. Remember Brian a while back uh, at a Wednesday night meeting, Brian said, hey, pray for me. I've got a blood test mm -hmm. coming up. I want to pray that the numbers are good and stuff and, and everything. Now, does that mean that because we prayed for that, if the numbers came back bad, that, that, that we're not? No, it just means that God has a different plan, a different approach. To it. But, you know, sometimes I think prayer makes all the difference. I think sometimes God just waits for people to pray. God just waits for people to get on their knees. If my people who are called by my name, well, what? Humble yeah. themselves and repent and pray. And, right? So, I mean, even our, even for God to work in our nation, he's waiting for what? People to pray. But not just, but everybody, right? He wants lots of people, not just a few. He wants lots of people to pray. If my people who are called by my name. So, anyway, if you really believe, if you really believe that, that the prayer of a righteous has great power and is effective. When problems or critics cause stress in your life, you're going to ask others to pray for you. You'll, you'll do that. Um, don't be afraid to ask that. Don't be afraid to say at times, hey, hey guys, especially when we're in house church and stuff, and, and, and just say, guys, look, there's, there's this guy at work, there's this lady at work, that they're really, they, they're really being critical of me, they're really after me, they're you know, it just seems like they don't like me for anything. Would you pray for them and pray for my relationship with them and pray for God's will in their life too? And I pray that I'll be a good response. And, and stuff like that. Don't be afraid to ask for prayer like that because that can make uh, your job and where you work a really influential place for you as a Christian because you have the prayer support of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, so I just don't be afraid to do that. So, so it, it says when you do that, when you ask people to pray for you, you immediately are going to be on your way to stress-free living because you know you're not alone. you got God, but you got your brothers and sisters in Christ too. Amen? Yep. And that's, that's a good thing. about it. We see that over and over again in the Bible. It's it's God with us, but it's also brothers and sisters in Christ. In the New Testament, it's always about And even in the Old Testament, it's about God's people working together, being together, supporting one another. Uh, I mean, all the way from Moses and Aaron and all the things that Aaron did. Moses couldn't do what he did without Aaron standing here holding up his arm. Remember that? And uh, so it, it, it's about people helping, and Christians helping one another like that. So prayer is uh, for one another is absolutely essential and it's amazingly effective. He goes on to say, Paul also says his deliverance will be the result of the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, who is the Holy Spirit. Now, when Jesus taught about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14, he called the Holy Spirit the paraclete. 
That's, a, that's the Greek word for Holy Spirit, it's paraclete. That word is translated in the NIV version as counselor. In the King James Version, it's translated as comforter. In the New American Standard Bible, it's translated as helper. And really, all three are correct. All three of those translations are correct. Uh, he is the counselor. He is the comforter. He is the helper. He is the encourager. He is the one who lifts us up. Amen? I mean, he is the one. Who, that's who he is. So, in fact, what wonderful truth does 2 Corinthians 3.17 tell us about the Holy Spirit? Listen to this. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Wow. There is freedom wherever the Spirit of the Lord is. I think the founders of America understood that. They understood how important it was that this country be founded on the Word and the Spirit of God. Because that's where freedom is found. And the less of the Spirit of God, the less of the Word of God we, we have, the less freedoms we have. Because all that's left then is kings and kingdoms, totalitarian rule, fascism, I mean, you, you, communism, you name it, that's all that's left. Uh, what has given America its standing in the world to this point has truly been because of our relationship with God from the very beginning. And, um, and I pray to God that we find that once again. I, I am convinced that probably Jesus is returning soon. I'm convinced of that. But on the other hand, I don't know when. So I'm praying that before that happens, God will truly allow revival to occur in our land again. And freedoms will once again be able to be enjoyed. Um, freedoms that we are losing and losing very quickly right now. Um, I, I think you know as well as I do that the Second, the second Amendment's on the rope right now. And um, it's, just a, it's just a vote away from being dismantled and done away with. Uh, Canada's already done that. Australia has done that. The United States is on the edge of that. And once the Second Amendment is done away with, we have, then, then we truly will become communistic. Because the only thing that's, the only thing that, you know what the, I think I told you this before, I don't know, I think I told you this before, but you know what the Japanese emperor said after, uh, after the war was over? What he said about America, somebody asked him, why didn't he attack the mainland America? And he said, I would never attack mainland America because behind every blade of grass would be a gun. And because he knew that typical Americans were armed, they wouldn't dare come across the border like that. They wouldn't dare attack America like that because they knew Americans would defend themselves. Even the mm -hmm. Russians know. Even they know that too. And, and the Chinese, right. they, they know we have yeah, guns. They do. That's why... Even they are. Right. If they came over to... militarily, they know that there would be a, a, a grassroots military response, that we would do that. And so, but once they take our guns away, once that's gone, there's nothing to stop communistic rule. Cool the only thing, I, you know, apart from God, the only thing that stops it is the right to bear arms. And, uh, and we, boy, we don't want to lose. I know how tragic and how heart wrenching Uvalde was. And, and all, all the others that have happened prior to this. But you know, the reality is they've done nothing to protect the schools or to change anything. And they, they won't do anything because their real objective is the Second Amendment. Okay. They, they just want to do away with guns. I've been thinking about that this last week. And I'm thinking, you know, you cannot legislate evil. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how many laws or rules or provisions or whatever we have, you can't stop evil. Right. The only thing that can stop evil is good. That's right. And and that's what people don't understand. Right. Right. And even, it, it, look, it, you know, good people won't have guns, but evil people will find them wherever they want. Them, wherever oh, they absolutely. Want. They, they always do that. The, the problem I have with the school system right now, too, is, and, and I've always had, is they could secure the schools very easily if they wanted to. I mean, they, they secure other buildings. They, they secure all kinds of things that they want to secure. They could secure the school and still experience tremendous freedom in the school and it'd be secure. They could do that if they really wanted to do that. And there are tons of people who would be willing to step up and say, I'll be trained, I'll do whatever you ask me to do to secure that school. 
They just don't do it because the real objective is the elimination of the Second Amendment. And um, and I know that's that's hard to hear sometimes is that, that the schools are, are governed that way, but they are. Public schools are, are owned by the teachers' union, which is really owned by the liberal arm of the, uh, of the country. So they're after the Second Amendment. So anyway, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And we want freedom back. And so we have to pray that more of God will be invested in our country, not less. Amen? Amen. And we have to try to inject more of God in our country, not less. Despite how difficult it might be to do that. Well, he says, when we allow the Holy Spirit to fill and guide us, we experience freedom from all kinds of stress. And prayer and the paraclete work together to strangle stress in our lives. And so to enjoy life in the midst of adversity, you got to keep problems in perspective, keep the critics in context, and keep prayer and the paraclete of the Holy Spirit in the plan. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, guys, that's it for tonight's study. Thank you for being here. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you for the remainder of the week. And may He give you a stress-free <laughs> remainder of the week. Amen.